back and look at my father's lifetime. We'll go back to the year of 1930. He was born in 31, but I just picked the 30s, the early 30s. And how much life has changed for him in his lifetime. I saw a, um, a, a web um, seminar uh, called uh, Life in, in the Next 20 Years Will Look Nothing Like the Last 20 Years. But I'm kind of expanding upon one man's lifetime. In the 1930s, 22% of the workforce were farmers. In 2000, that number was less than three. So in the 1930s, about 25% of the people who worked in the workforce worked on farms, lived on, worked on farms. Most of us don't anymore. In the 1930s, 58% of farms had cars. Less, just a little over half. Now, all of them have cars. In 1930s, 34 percent of the farms had telephones. In 2005, that number was 98 percent. In the 1930s, only 13 percent had electricity. Now, almost all of them do. Less than 50% of all the homes had a TV or a radio. Now almost every home has a TV and multiple TVs and satellite TVs and TV in the bedroom and the kitchen and every room has a television except your house. Wood, kerosene, and coal were the primary fuels. The horse and buggy were the preferred transportation. In the 1930s, the U.S. population was 123 million. In 2008, the U.S. population was 302 million. There's a, 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 a was a, a for instance of, of uh, do you know what an EMP is? An electromagnetic pulse. Have you heard this term before? <clears throat> um, one of the things that scares the living daylights out of me is um, about three or four months ago. Do you remember hearing that Iran was testing their their rockets and they were shooting off rockets in the Gulf? Did you hear about that? The Iran was testing their rockets, except they weren't testing land-based rockets. They were putting them on a barge and taking them out into the the uh, the uh, the ocean and firing them off, and then they blew them up at apogee. In other words, at their highest point, they had not, and they blew them up. Rather than testing them, they have test ranges where they could have fired them from land to land, or from the ocean to the land, or from the land to the ocean. But they didn't do that. They fired them from barges and then blew them up at apogee, at their, at their highest peak. And, and nobody could really figure out why they were doing that. Well, if you take a, nuclear, if you take a small yield nuclear weapon and put it into a city like the size of Los Angeles, you're going to destroy about a half a mile radius. And, but, Outside of that, you're really not going to have it. I mean, it's going to be dev it would be devastating, not unlike the, the Twin Towers. You know, it would shut down the city for a period of time, but it's not. It, is, it would be devastating, but not widely so. If you take a medium yield nuclear weapon, put it on a barge off the coast, and fire it up about 40 kilometers up in the sky and explode it, it will cause what's called an EMP, an electromagnetic pulse. An electromagnetic pulse will fry almost every circuit board, your cell phones, your computers all of these things, the power grid, will all suddenly shut off from an area from like San Diego to Santa Barbara. No power. And no, not, and there would be, not that your, your computer would shut off and you just have to reboot it again, it would not work. And because of, they have, there's a system that they're putting in place called SCADA, S-C-A-D-A, -A. it is a computer controlled, um, system for, for controlling pipelines of electricity. They're all controlled by computers. Those are not hardened and failed to work. In fact, I, I read these things so you guys don't have to. A 206 page uh, government study on EMPs, one of the things I found fascinating was they had one of these SCADA controllers that was controlling the natural gas flow into the city of San Diego, it got fried and they couldn't figure out why. They had to send people out to fix it, fix the valve, get it all back to working. They finally figured out what it was. As the Pacific Fleet was coming back into port, they were supposed to turn off their radar or shut it down, and they didn't. And so 25 miles offshore, the radar from one of the, one, one of the naval ships sent out a, enough, a magnetic pulse enough to fry this thing 25 miles inland. That was a little disconcerting. So those kind of things 
having something like that happen could really be devastating to our way of life um, and really put us in a position, like I said, put us back in the horse and buggy days without horse and buggy. We would instantly be back in the 1800s, but we would have the 20, 21st century population. And feeding and, and everything else would be really kind of difficult. That's way beyond an emergency. That's way beyond an emergency. That's why we need to be more reliant on being on, worry about self-reliance. To that end, to being self-reliant, I want to share with you, I'm going to, I'm going to do this the second time in a row, I'm going to do what you should never do as a speaker, and that is hand out any written things while you're talking. You should never do that, by the way, because people will read what you're talking about rather than listening to you. I'm going to give it to you so we can kind of go through this, and you'll see what I'm talking about as we go through it. Two things I'm going to hand out. One is uh, a direct copy right from um, the, the uh, a, a, a website that I read all, every day, every single day, called uh, survivalblog.com. And it's written by a gentleman by the name of James Wesley Rawls. And uh, you remember I talk, told you earlier before the camera came on that there's a lot of websites out there, you know, by guys who live in bunkers in Idaho. Well, this is just one step above the bunkers in Idaho, but these are people who are, who are serious about self-reliance and, and things like that. And this guy has been right every single time. Uh, there was a big, a big blog in there that talked about the price of tuna will go up 30 or 40 percent. Go out and buy some. So I went out and bought some. Guess what? About a month and a half later, the price of tuna had gone up by 40 percent. He'd said in January of last year that the price of wheat and rice were going to just about double. So I went out and bought wheat and rice. Guess what? The price of wheat and rice just about doubled. So this guy and the people who write in and, 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 and uh, send in information to this site are, uh, in my book, very accurate about the things that have happened and are going to happen. So I'm going to give you a, a list fr from him, and we're going to talk about this. It's a list of lists. And I'm going to give you something that I've put together from a couple of other things called the 100 things that disappear first in an emergency. But he calls this his list of lists. And he starts off by saying... Um, in the third paragraph there, uh, the second paragraph, it says, As I often mention in my lectures and radio interviews, a great way to, cr create, to create truly common sense preparedness list is to take a three-day weekend. Tio Twaki, if you don't know what that acronym stands for, it says the, the end of the world as we know it. That does not mean the earth is going to split in half and all population dies. If the power to, were to go out, that is the end of the world as you know it. Because you flip on the light switch, lights don't come on. That's a problem. Now that doesn't mean it is the end. It just means that it's the end of the world as you know it, at least temporarily. 